Good evening, everyone. I'm Amanda Hunt, Director of Education and Curator of Programs here at MOCA. Um, and I'm here to welcome you and Miljan Ruperto, our star artists on artists for this evening's program. Um, artists on artists is a long-standing series at this museum that is a format pairing um, artists of multiple disciplines with uh, perhaps another artist on view in our galleries or an exhibition. Um, and it's a really fruitful space in which, um, first of all, you get to see the work of another's uh, artwork through the lens of another artist. That's always something that's enlightening. We're always learning more, I think. But first, to contextualize a little bit about the exhibition on view upstairs. Um, for the first time in its history, MOCA has invited LA-based artists to organize exhibitions drawn from our collection, um, which is over 7,500 objects. Um, the art artist selected work will and does, um, in this instance, has worked with MOCA curators to excavate certain things and kind of work through our permanent collection um, in ways that we haven't done before. Um, it's not unusual to other museums and institutional practices, but this is a really exciting moment for us in our 40th year to start to do some of that work, um, bringing these th things back out into light uh, in order to continue to serve, educate, inform, uh, and represent the diverse and extensive community of artists that we have here um, in Southern California and by extension in the MOCA collection. Um, Open House Elliot Hundley is organized by multimedia artist uh, Elliot Hundley and it explores architecture and origins of collage. Um, if you're familiar with his practice, it's really dense and I think the exhibition functions in a collagist kind of framework as well. It's been really interesting to see it unfold uh, through his eyes. So he's chosen certain things that resonate. There's a lot of um, pathos in the show. There's a lot of mortality um, in the exhibition. Um, there's darkness and lightness, and I'm, I'm sure that Mil John will kind of address some of those things in the space of his conversation. But this particular artist, Mil John Ruperto, will be talking about this particular artist, Manuel Ocampo. Um, so that's, that's what to expect this evening. Briefly about Miljan Ruperto, his practice is um, pretty rigorous and cerebral and incredible. He makes beautiful videos, things, um, and I think was the perfect mind to kind of put to this task for this evening. Um, he received his MFA from Yale University and his BA in studio art from the University of California, Berkeley and his recent exhibitions featuring um, his works include On the Shoulders of Fallen Giants, Second Industrial Art Biennial uh, in Croatia, Stories of Almost Everyone at the Hammer Museum here in LA, uh, Geomancies at Red Cat Gallery just across the street, Nervous Systems, House to Culture and Develop uh, in Berlin, After Work, Parasite in Hong Kong, uh, and the 2014 Whitney Biennial. Um, which is a pretty incredible list of things. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming artist Miljan Ruperto. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Amanda, um, for inviting me, and thanks to MOCA. Okay, so tonight, I will be talking about Filipino artist Manuel Ocampo's 1991 painting called Untitled, as you can see here, in the context of three theological formulations of the apocalypse. So this talk is gonna be a little different in that um, we're gonna read this. I'm gonna contextualize it in terms of these theolo theological ideas. Um, yeah, so let's jump right into it. So the three, the three theological formulations of the apocalypse, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, also called dispensationalism, and praetorism, I will focus on these three formulations and how they affect an understanding of time, of historical time. So the first is post-millennialism. In Arthur H. Williamson's Apocalypse Then, Prophecy and the Making of the Modern World, 
Williamson proposes that the imagining and reimagining of the apocalypse led to an establishing of historical time as a developmental process, which then opened up the possibility of a progressive march towards democratization. Um, so Williamson starts out in the Middle Ages where he presents the experience of time as being cyclical. Um, so through the turn of seasons, year after year, the motif of this era was the wheel of fortune. And so fortunes rise and fall, yet time keeps uh, turning, but your station remains the same. And it's through um, this idea called, uh, this hierarchical idea called the great chain of being, where in a way you're cosmologically assigned to your station. So um, in a way you don't even imagine uh, transformation or, or change. Um, you're happy to be in, in your specific station. Um, but through the, the sort of the, okay, so in the imagining of an end, cyclical time transforms into linear historical time. So um, Williamson argues that in sort of rethinking about rethinking the apocalypse in medieval times or bringing it back somehow, um, you start thinking about the future. So if you expect, let's say, the Antichrist to come in the future, you would have to start thinking about your relationship to prophecy. And you start to develop uh, this notion of futurity. So unsurprisingly, this eschatological shaping of history brought about ideas of societal reform. The redemptive developmental history begins to inspire faith in politics as a, mean, as a means to drastically transform society. Um, so mainly thinkers in, in the Protestant context, which is important for Williamson, start to ask, you know, how should we collectively shape our society so we may be worthy when Christ comes back at the millennium, right? So post-millennialists, um, believe that that the that the end was gonna come sometime in the future and Christ will come back. So for Williamson, the Protestant Reformation and the English Civil War serve as really important touchstones. He argues that apocalyptic thinking pegged a progressive pegged the progressive incrementally improving society to the linear development of history, right? So now people started to have um, stakes within historical development. Um, so human rights, political rights became important. The unfolding of history became the site of political and spiritual contestation, right? So it becomes more dynamic and uh, there's all these possibilities that opened up with, with this um, with starting to think in terms of historical time. In this formulation, Christ comes at the end of the millennium. So this formulation is called post-millennialism. Um, so the, the apocalypse happens and the tribulations, then after that, um, Christ comes, comes at the end. Um, so from the Middle Ages to the 19th century, post-millennialism had great influence in the European and the American context. And throughout the book, Williamson develops the th his thesis that the post-millennialist imaginary eventually ushered in the secular world. Okay, so the second um, formulation is called dispensationalism or premillennialism. By the 19th century, however, a new development began to undermine the progressive historical movement of the post-millennialist. Dispensationalism introduced by John Nelson Darby countered the effects of this progressive apocalyptic thinking. Since in this formulation, Christ comes in the beginning of the millennium as opposed to the end, um, so Christ comes first to sweep away the present. Um, 
So this is why it's called premillennialism. So Christ comes first before before uh, the so he he marks the the beginning of the apocalypse, right? For Darby, God's relationship to the world can be divided into multiple multiple dispensations or epochs. In our current time, the time between Christ's death and the second coming, Darby calls this the age of grace. And um, the age of grace is sort of known to be um, sort of a, a pause in a way. It's, it's marked by this lack of interaction between God and the world, right? So therefore, therefore, in a theological, cosmological sense, this age is an is, is unimportant, it's an aside. Um, uh, Darby goes on to, to call this age the great parentheses, uh, which will end uh, with the rapture and the apocalypse and, and then giving way to the, uh, to the age of the millennial kingdom where Christ will, will uh, reign for a thousand years. So that's where you know, the millennial um, comes from. Dispensationalism then subvert, subverted the concept of de developmental historical time. Instead of finding meaning in the unfolding of history, premillennialism uh, found meaning from, from imminent crisis. It would be helpful to think about these formulations through the Greek conception of time. So there's chronos and kairos. Kronos is quantitative, sequential time. It's able to be measured, it's consistent, it's, it's Cartesian time, right? And uh, versus Kairos, which is qualitative time. It's inherently subjective, and Kairos's denotation includes timeliness, um, uh, timeliness and its relation to the dyad of crisis and opportunity, right? So it's a completely subjective uh, time. It's 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 it depends on the 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 subjective read of 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 what's happening. There is also an inward turning with the pre premillennialism. Um, there there's a turning inward and. Um, and the dissolving of faith in, in politics, um, as opposed to the, the post-millennialists who completely opened up and embraced politics. Um, so premillennialism, through its um, thinking about the end and the rapture, right? So premillennials are, are, are believe in, in the rapture. Um, there, there's a sense of um, escaping his historical time. Um, Williamson sees the appearance of dispensationalism in the 19th century in parallel to the appearance of the secular movement of modern, modernism um, in the way that they both challenge the conception of linear time by foregrounding the possibility of s simultaneity. So, from his book, Williamson writes, the critique of time, both sacred and secular, extend well beyond the right to embrace the full range of politics, and much more forms part of a broad cultural shift of the greatest consequence. In literature, the Victorian novel with its intricate interwoven plot and character development came to be replaced by modernist poetry and novels that rejected narrative for the mythic method and drastically compressed time in densely layered, simultaneous ways. In social science, the rise of complex organization from simple hunter-gatherers to the intricacies of industrial modernity became displaced by atemporal analyses of social structures, interpreting symbol systems rather than assessing historical development. The life sciences now focus on microbiology rather than Darwinism. While Sigmund Freud looked away from evolution, the panorama of the rise and fall of a species to the largely timeless engines that powered evolution, the drives. The physical, scientists, the physical science, sciences reveal a similar pattern. Newton, 
had maintained, quote, absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows e equally without relation to any external thing, end quote. Albert Einstein's theories of special and general relativity, 1905 and 1910, changed time from an absolute to a local and diminished phenomenon, defined contextually. Fine art, whether romantic, realist, or impressionist, has sought to capture a moment in time. Modernist art, like Cubism, collapsed many moments into a single layered space that defied the linear. Okay, so that's from his text. Um, William further punctuates this parallel with the coincidence of the Schofield reference Bible, the core text for dispensationalism, and Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto, Foundation and Declaration of Futurism, both being printed in 1909. So dispensationalism places the present always in relation to the perpetual looming catastrophe of the apocalypse. In a way, this is, this is how it gets its energy. Um, for closing on the promise of a, develop, a developmental history, thereby dissolving political agency. Um, so this is what uh, Williamson believes. Um, his, historical momentum disappears for the, the dispensationalist. Only the loop of the perpetual ending remain. So, so the way dispensationalists see, th see time is um, you're always on the, the precipice of, of uh, catastrophe. Um, by instrumentalizing the imminence of the cataclysmic as an engine to expand its influence, post-millennialism eventually won the hearts and minds of late 20th and early 21st century fundamentalist Christians in America. So this is where we're at. In the present day, we can recognize this crisis as expansion in the secular world. The recent readings of the contemporary state of globalized capitalism feeding off crisis as a method of expansion can coincide with these premillennial drives where it is in the threat of crisis that value and meaning are created. This is the perpetual state of emergency. Philosopher Stephen Shapiro, in addressing acceleration and accelerationism writes, it has become increasingly clear that crises and contradictions do not lead to the demise of capitalism. Rather, they actually work to promote and advance capitalism by providing it with its fuel. Crises do not endanger the capitalist order. Rather, they are occasions for the dramas of, quote, creative destruction, end quote, by means of which Phoenix-like capitalism repeatedly renews itself. We are all caught within this loop. And accelerationism in philosophy or political e e economy offers us, at best, an exacerbated awareness of how we are trapped. Um, okay. So the, the, the third formulation uh, is called praetorism. And, um, and praetorism is a counter-reformation tactic developed in the 16th century by the Spanish Jesuit uh, Luis de Alcazar to halt the movement of Protestantism in Europe. In his book, The Study of the Secret Meaning of the Apocalypse, Alcazar contextualized John of Patmos' vision of the visions in Revelation, which are the basis for, for the apocalypse, within the political milieu of the of first century Asia Minor, right? So he historicizes this, uh, this uh, he historicizes the future. The upcoming apocalypse, he says that it's, it's actually occurred. Alcazar demythologized this text by insisting that the text's fantastic revelations were actually political allegory for the Roman occupation at the time. So for Alcazar, all events in Revelation have already passed before 70 AD when the text was written. So there is no apocalypse in the future. Praetorism, through historicizing of prophecy, attempted to dismantle the apocalyptic engine which drove the Protestant expansion in the 16th century Europe. And so maybe it did kind of work, right? Because Protestantism was, was, was halted. 
so again, so let me sort of just reiterate. So post-millennialism is sort of a, this, this way of conceiving time historically, right? Like a, a gradual um, progressive movement. And pre-millennial, pre-millennialism undercuts that pro- pro- progressive um, view, right? By insisting that there is no history and that we're always in the cusp of, of catastrophe, right? We're always on the cusp of the apocalypse. And praetorism, um, which undercuts both of these uh, trajectories by uh, historicizing the, the future apocalypse into the past. So within the context of these three formulations, I would like to discuss Manuel Campos painting Untitled from 1991. But first, I would like to present a position that the post-colonial is the post-apocalypse. What I mean to say is that through colonial violence, the horror of catastrophic social and environmental upheaval and collapse has already been realized. The apocalypse has passed, and the current post-colonial project of the reformulation of society, the piecing together of population, culture, and identity, is a post-apocalyptic dystopian endeavor. Multiple apocalypses have already occurred in the past in different time frames and different cultural registers. I would also want to clarify um, when I talk about the apocalyptic in relation to Campos' work, I mean apocalyptic Im- imagery, uh, aesthetics. And when I talk about the post apocalyptic, I mean to describe a post colonial historical register. In the mid-1980s, Manuel Ocampo moved from the Philippines to the United States as a new immigrant, and in the early 90s embarked on a series of anti-colonial paintings which he is mostly known for. Resembling old religious moral paintings called Venitas, Ocampo's painting scrambles the holy and the sacrilegious, violence and nonsense, potent symbology and the absurd into a terrifying apocalyptic vision. In 1991, the same year as this painting was painted, the LA Times titled its review of a Campos exhibition at the Fred Hoffman Gallery in Santa Monica, the apocalyptic vision of Manuel Ocampo. So from Ocampo's initial adoption of this style of painting, these anti-colonial works have, have always been um, connected to the apocalypse. Um, the, the LA Times quotes, an apocalyptic vision of these evil times. This is from Ocampo. In a recent conversation with Ocampo regarding his style, the painter stated that he liked to imagine as if he accidentally found a mysterious painting in a church store in LA, previously lost and forgotten. Ocampo, to achieve this fiction of distancing and anonymity, employed a generic style of Anita's painting and filled the pictorial compositions pictorial space with compositions of opaque apocalyptic symbology and iconography. So in this case, um, there's a Chinese text for a rooster brand mosquito repellent, a figuration of a decapitated man and his severed and his flying decapitated head, and a collection of similarly sized crosses, the Cairo on top, the Christian cross, an X, the Coptic cross, which maybe is Malevich's uh, black cross, and the Nazi swastika. There's also a snake, an obscured sign composed of Latin and Greek letters, and, and a white city, possibly Jerusalem, the city upon a hill. Some of the images are enumerated. Ocampo's provocation in equalizing the disparate crosses relies on the suspension of multiple historical registers. Where did they come from? From when? By what? By comparing the formal histories of these crosses, Ocampo illustrates a linear developmental history while coalescing these histories into a disparate antagonistic symbology. In Untitled, the other imagery works similarly. The, image, the image's historical trajectories are held in suspension, asked for a slow read to trace out these trajectories 
and their relationships to each other as their boundaries begin dissolving just by their proximity to each other. Um, in a way, they, they sort of um, melt into each other. They're, they infect each other. These configurations illustrate the anxiety of, of collapse, of post-colonial collapse and catastrophe, the disillusion of symbolic integrity and the disillusion of integrities of meanings, subjectivities, histories, paradigms. It's, it's a disillusion of the logic of the whole. On the bottom right-hand corner, Ocampo signs the painting with his initials and curiously backdates it to 1977. The painting was painted in, um, was painted in 1991. So he backdates it as a way to send the painting to the past. I find this really weird and strange. Um, but in unpacking this operation, we can possibly align a compost method with uh, the pre the praetorist strategy of historicizing prophecy. Um, within this post-colonial present, Ocampo's depiction of the apocalypse predates its own making, marking the apocalypse in the past. So what he's doing is he, he's, he's eroding the possibility of a future like a future apocalypse by burying it in the past, right? This is all fiction, of course. The difference between Praetorism, which is a conservative reactionary position, and Ocampo's strategy is that Ocampo accounts for simultaneity, the possibility of experiencing multiple histories and time frames at the same time. The, Praetor, the Praetorist position insists on the status quo. Um, so in context of premillennialism, this, this strategy short circuits the centripetal force of the perpetual crisis loop by displacing the apocalyptic crisis engine to the past, dissipating the momentum of imminent catastrophe. This strategy exhausts the state of perpetual crisis by sending it back in time, its imminence flattened out and located in context of a linear history. It's buried. So, how can you fear the apocalypse when the apocalypse has already happened? I would like to end with a description of a failed future in the past. In the fall of 1844, in upstate New York, a proto-premillennial Christian group called the Millerites, led by preacher William Miller, waited for the world to end. Miller at first calculated that the apocalypse will arrive in 1843, but after a series of setbacks where multiple predictions did not come true, the Millerites, through deeper biblical exegesis, settled on October 22, 1844 as, as the correct date of the apocalypse's arrival. But that day closed with great anguish as the apocalypse did not arrive. The Millerites dissolved and the movement ended. The event became known as the Great Disappointment. Um, thank you. That's the end of my talk. Um, I think we're going to take questions if anyone has any question. I'm going to be cheap and ask the first question. Okay. So I described artist on artist and this whole premise to the group before we went into this full analysis um, of the work. And I was just wondering, what kind of resonances did you find kind of in this process and doing this deep? In what? What kind of resonances did you find in this process of looking so deeply at the painting and thinking in your own practice and just the logic of your own work and and you know, we've been talking a lot about crisis even before the talk started, so just wanting to understand where you found yourself in some of this. I mean, I mean, right now I'm really obsessed with these, with, uh, with, you know, with the apocalypse. So I've been thinking, I've been thinking 
a lot about it. And also this formulation of post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, and preterism. And I'm, I've been trying to test out how these combine to open up um, certain things, you know? Um, and so this is my first attempt. And so it's through these three um, formulations that I am looking at Manuel's uh, work. And so, and I, and I thought it, it fit pretty well. And in the, in the way I really, I mean, I think what I really love about this painting is really the, the, back, the back dating. And I think that's a, that's a weird uh, thing to do, yeah, yeah. Jason. Thanks, Mel John. I thought um, <clears throat> one of my clear takeaways from your talk is when dealing with the apocalypse, rule number one is never try to call the date. Um, yeah, yeah. I, Wait, let me say yeah. something. Um, so the, the, when the Millerites dissolve, a lot of them fold it into the Seventh-day Adventist, which they, they, don't, they don't announce a date. Yeah. Right. Um, so I guess, I guess my question is what, when, assuming you had the benefit of actually seeing the object, can you step us through a little bit about what's going on with the, um, with the patina and the elements that seem to be going toward, you know, working really hard to make this seem like a, a recovered artifact? Yeah. Almost to the point of like, uh, theatricality or like count counterfeiting an artifact yeah. and what, yeah. Talk. Can you maybe speak to how that plays into the to the experience of the piece? Yeah. I, I mean, that's sort of the strategy that that Acampo employs, right? This 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 trying. He's trying to. He's doing multiple things. One of them is uh, distancing this this style from himself, and also distancing this object from his, himself. And in that, um, in. In that action, he's he's trying to uh, you know make this painting into you know to somehow put it in the past, to bury it in the past, to to rise up again, you know. But all of this stuff is in suspension, right? Because it, it is a fiction. It's a counterfeit, right? It's a counterfeit, fake, old religious painting, right? Um, yeah. Does that answer? Hi, uh, with all your study and research into the apocalypse, have you become a prepper? Um, no, not really. I, I just, yeah, I like, I like thinking about the apocalypse in terms of this, this, you know, thinking about time. That's mostly my attraction to it, yeah, yeah. Um, within all these, well, the three different schools of thought regarding the apocalypse, yeah. if you had to choose one, which one would you say is closer to your approach? Um, I'm more, I mean, I'm more inclined for the Praetorist uh, formulation. <laughs> I mean, because in a way I'm taking positions against this sort of, uh, um, this, you know, I, I mean, to answer your question also, that in a way, we're all preppers now, you know? Um, we've, we've become apocalyptic in our thinking and also in our actions in terms of, you know, uh, you know in terms of being, um, yeah. Yeah, you would, I don't know. I mean, there, there's all these sort of um, hope that somehow we could pierce through this, 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 this cycle. Um, somehow things will historicize themselves, but 
like in the accelerationist uh, quote, um, it seems like it's a, it, you know, like it uses, capitalism uses crisis to, to, to expand and to accelerate, you know. Hello, Morgan. Hi, hi Mel John. Um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to begin by observing that um, the way you're talking about the apocalypse and the apocalyptic supposes only one religious tradition. Yeah. Um, and there's more than one. Yeah. There's a whole bunch. <clears throat> yeah. But um, the one you you have in mind is, is the default for yeah. the moment, at least in yeah. um, in the West. For the moment. Yeah. Uh, but I, so that's something we might want to think about. But I'm interested in, if you could please talk about in what way are we all preppers? Because aren't there several kinds of apocalypses? There are apo there's the apocalypse as embraced by um, uh, people who believe in the rapture, like Mike Pompeo, for example. Yeah. And then that's a religious apocalypse. And then there's a kind of metaphorical one. Uh, for those of us who are not believers. Um, um, and there's um, a secular one, namely that um, the world is heading for global disaster and um, no one is going to be saved. Uh, those who want to believe in a religious apocalypse, I think, are in for a disappointment. But, um, so I'm wondering if we can just ex sort of, um, if you can talk about the several varieties of the ap apocalypse or the apocalyptic in relation to your interest in it, in relation to this painting. Um, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the first point with um, sort of the, the focus only in um, uh, Western tradition is I wanted to contain it within sort of the the dynamic, the post, the, or the colonial dynamic between uh, Spain, the Philippines, and the United States. So their history together as a, you know, as a, I don't know, a colonial disaster. Um, yeah. So I wanted to locate it in 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 the traditions of of those three. Uh, countries. Um, in terms of the, um, the different types of apocalypses, um, yeah, uh, the premillennials are, are, they believe in the rapture. And so the rapture really uh, informs a lot of premillennial thinking, you know, and attitudes. And so we're mostly, I mean, most Christian, American Christian fundamentalists are, are premillennials, dispensationalists. Um, and, and I guess, in a way, the, this talk is also thinking through and thinking around this, the idea of the Anthropocene of environmental collapse. Um, and, and this is actually how it kind of started my, my, my um, thinking or position that the, that the post-colonial is also the post-apocalypse. And to think about it in that way when, when let's say, as the West sort of rallies everyone together to, to tie, uh, um, you, know, you know, the, the earth collapse, you know, um, to think about it or be mindful of that, uh, you know, like complete, uh, you know, a catastrophic, uh, you know, um, you know, disaster already happened in many, um, you know, that happened through colonialism in, 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 in the history of the world. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? Oh, Matt?
thanks, Mil John. Um, I, I suppose I wonder, listening to you, if the the preterist has a kind of existential character. The postmillennial sounds like a Hegelian or kind of teleology, and the premillennial feels fatalist, like why you're going back to these more fundamental Christian philosophies and, and, and how you see them repeating maybe uh, in more uh, critical terms with Marxism have a, having a post-millennial uh, yeah. character and, and, and what sort of critical tools you think this might be leading to in terms of art criticism or art as a form of critique? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I mean, for me, it's weird that, that you know, you take some, some feature of apocalyptic thinking and you, in a way, it, it rhymes with, with, with sort of like a contemporary secular uh, feature, you know? Um, I think that's really weird. Um, yeah. So I think these things come and they have a history and they come from somewhere and, you know, they repeat, they loop, they, they, you know, they disappear, they come back, but, you know, like all these things are, are, you know, are, are coming from the past to haunt us, you know? I'm, I'm really into this idea of haunting and, and ghosts, and these are the ghosts that, that haunt us, you know? Um, these ideas that we think are buried and, and, you know, super religious or whatever, um, there's been a lot of news coverage about these um, supporters of, of um, say, Israel, and a lot of their interest in Israel comes from a Protestant um, context, and they're evidently making trips there to kind of do the sort of work you're doing here in terms of really seeing Israel in its current state as a stage for some kind of rapture, as you described it. Yeah, the fundamentalists are, are, are religious accelerationists, you know? They they want the rapture to 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 come soon as soon as possible, yeah. And so th this is this is kind of you know this you know like it's it's it sort of coincides with also this 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 um, this belief in in crisis to 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 move us you know from from one moment to the next. I think is completely crazy. I just want to ask one more thing, given the, the time frame here, yeah. there was a millennialism in the 90s, you know, that yeah. is, is important as far as the framework of yeah. the actual production date. Yeah. So how do you think things compare to when the, the painting was made in terms of some of these dynamics? I mean, the, the very discourse of um, colonialism and cultural studies was at a really different place then than it is now, just from an academic standpoint. Um, <laughs> what's, what's the question? Sorry. I suppose I, I'm wondering if you feel like Ocampo maybe um, was, is, was taking on feel something. But I wonder if you think the artist was taking on... Um, yeah, for sure, right? Like, the I mean, spirit it, of his time. Yeah, the millennial was uh, the millennium was coming up with the with the year two thousand, and so all these, you know, and all these movements, even in in LA, you know, um, that were, I mean, now we're 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 just always on the precipice of collapse, you know, and now we have like real environmental uh, reasons to to feel that we are on the precipice. Mm -hmm. But all these things, yeah. I guess I, I just want to keep them in suspension and, not, and, and, and maybe think about it in terms of, uh, there's a possibility for, for, for uh, thinking about our future demise outside of like a, you know, like this accelerationist, um, you know, crisis as a, as a, you know, like the state of this perpetual crisis, yeah. to sort of separate that out. That, that's kind of what I'm, I, I'm interested in, in that. Walid. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate this, but 
in broad strokes, do you think that Praetorist is an accurate depiction of a contemporary condition of suffering in a concrete sense, or is a reflection of a conceptual model that's dominant at this point in time? In other words, is, is it another ideological organization or a frame, or is it an accurate depiction of a contemporary state of affairs? I think, yeah, I think it's more of, of you know, the, the temperature in the room, you know? Or, um, I mean, in a way, you know, in overlaying, I mean, in a way, how it manifests just looks the same, right? Like, even if the, the, in the, the structure of it, it, in a way it doesn't, in looking at the structure of how, um, let's say the apocalypse manifest, it, that um, sort of the, the way we could accept this formulation of time, of, 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 of uh, imminent collapse or imminent catastrophe, uh, m match those that are, are, that come structurally. Does, this, does that make sense? I think so, I just am wondering what, what relationship that has to um, direct action in terms of interventions in conditions of suffering, yeah. or whether or not um, it's about constructing a dominant model that allows for inaction, in some sense. Yeah. Because of that act of distancing and destabilizing uh, a sense of, you know, the, the, the very backdating that yeah. you're sort of talking yeah. about. Yeah. Setting something in the past as something that's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. I think that's where we're at now. It's not like I don't think we can recoup like some sort of uh, linearity, you know, historical linearity. You know, like we already experience, you know, we're all moderns. So I think it's hard for us to, to go back. And so in a way, he, Ocampo is just playing games, right? And I don't think... Um, I think it's an, it's an active process, more so than, than uh, like pre-millennial, uh, the pre-millennial position where you completely just kind of, um, you know, um, distance yourself from, from, you know, the possibilities of amelioration, you know? Okay, great. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah.